My name is Philip Payne, and I'm the Janet and Bernard Becker Professor and Director of the Institute for Informatics at Washington University in St. Louis, where I also serve as the Associate Dean for Health Information and Data Science and Chief Data Scientist. And today I'd like to talk to you about a concept that I like to refer to as the Learning Health Record System, which is really about how do we instrument the care delivery environment so that every time we interact with patients, it's an opportunity to learn and improve our understanding of how we can make data-driven decisions that improve the care that individual receives, their family receives, and their community receives. I'll begin with the obligatory conflicts of interest and disclosure statements, which include my sources of research funding, academic consulting work, work in the international arena, consulting, editorial boards, as well as work in the corporate space. So first, what do I mean when I say we want to build a learning healthcare system? Well, ideally, a learning healthcare system is an environment in which we instrument the care delivery space, such that every time we interact with patients, we're able to capture and subsequently utilize data corresponding to biomolecular, imaging, clinical, behavioral, exposure, and many other layers of phenotyping. If we do this appropriately, we then have the opportunity to make that data available to more individuals, such that they can conduct real-time analytics and produce new evidence that improves the quality, safety, and outcomes of care. It's also important to note that in a learning healthcare system, we have the opportunity to leverage technology to not only collect all this data, but also to close the evidence cycle such that we can deliver tailored decision support at the patient, provider, or population levels that either encourage or modify behaviors or improve diagnosis and treatment, all of which may correspond to the risk of disease or disease outcomes. And then finally, we must continuously measure, evaluate, and improve all of these activities at a systems level. And this is really about a systems thinking or systems engineering approach to building a learning healthcare system in which we in fact use data every day to inform our decisions and improve outcomes for patients and populations. Now, oftentimes when people talk about the learning healthcare system, they think of it in an environment or a set of technology platforms. But my argument is in fact that the learning healthcare system is a set of behaviors and that those behaviors are in turn enabled by technology, but not always predicated on the use of digital interventions or approaches. So if we're going to build a learning healthcare system, the next question is, what is the living laboratory? Where does this type of innovation take place? And in particular, how do we study not only technology, but those behaviors that in conjunction with technology make up the learning healthcare system as I described to you earlier? My belief is that the electronic health record or EHR is that living laboratory. So why is that? Well, first and foremost, EHRs are real-time patient-centered records that allow us to capture and make sense of all the data generated during normal clinical care encounters. It's also important to know that the EHR is built purposely to include a broad view of a patient's health and wellness. Not only does the EHR contain data pertaining to a particular clinical encounter at a particular time point, but also includes longitudinal information concerning a patient's history, their prior diagnoses, medications, treatment plans, immunizations, allergies, images that may have been collected, laboratory test results, and many, many different sources of data. In addition, electronic health records intrinsically have the ability to provide for evidence-based care in which clinical decision support and computable guidelines can be used at the point of care to direct or enable the use of evidence-based practices to improve the quality, safety, and outcomes of clinical care delivery. And then finally, the EHR is purpose-built to automate or streamline workflow, to reduce redundant data entry, and improve the reusability and accessibility of information that's produced in the clinical environment. So importantly, EHRs are built from the ground up to share information with other healthcare providers, to create that durable record of what happened during a given encounter, but also allow us to look longitudinally at all the things that have happened to a patient in the past or to track what outcomes may occur in the future. 
And so therefore the EHR is a truly longitudinal record of all of the critical data that may define a given patient's journey through the healthcare delivery system, both in wellness and in disease states. However, you've probably read or heard that the EHR is problematic. In fact, you might've heard things like the workflow and human factors issues, the usability of the EHR preclude its use in a very efficient or effective manner. Basically, EHRs are too hard to use for both clinicians, patients, and researchers alike. Or you may have heard that issues such as data privacy and confidentiality make it too difficult to access data even if it has been collected in EHR. Effectively, the regulatory environments in which we operate prevent us from readily accessing the contents of the EHR for innovation purposes. Or perhaps you've heard that vendors are too difficult to work with and that they prevent us from building innovative solutions within or that are able to communicate with electronic health records. And then finally, you may have heard that IT organizations create too many roadblocks in their management of underlying IT infrastructure or cybersecurity, such that the EHR is too locked down in order to support the type of innovation that I'm describing today. And I wanna spend the rest of this talk talking about the facts and myths of all of these assumptions about the usefulness of the EHR, particularly as a living laboratory for building a learning healthcare system. So myth number one, as I talked about earlier, workflow and human factors issues cannot be adequately addressed. And therefore we can't rely on the EHR as a source of useful data. I'm sure many of you have heard from friends or professionals who are clinical care providers about their frustrations with the EHR. And in addition, the problems with data quality and completeness and missingness in the EHR. I'm going to argue that the field of biomedical informatics and biomedical data science provides a robust toolbox for us to optimize workflow and human factors surrounding the EHR. And this toolbox includes many different methods such as time and motion studies, formal human factors and usability evaluations, the assessment of cognitive and decision analyses concerning how the use of technology impacts clinical decision making, iterative user-centered design mechanisms that allow us to produce better human-computer interaction models, qualitative inquiries concerning barriers to effective use of the EHR, and then mixed method studies that use some combination of all of these different dimensions. And I'm going to drill down and talk about one of these particular tools in particular, and that will be time and motion studies. So what are time and motion studies? Well, time and motion studies are studies in which observers go into an environment, such as a hospital or clinic, and study the ways in which people use technology and the timing and sequencing of events that occur during the course of normal workflows. This often includes something which involves recording the time used for each one of those steps. And there are many different ways in which those times and steps can be recorded, either by an external observer, as I talked about earlier, through self-report from the subjects of a study, or automated collection of data through sensors or time stampings of log files and many other electronic sources of such information. Now, the important thing is that mechanisms such as continuous observation time motion studies, which are the most common form of such time motion studies, allow us to see how humans and computers interact in real world settings and where that interaction is efficient and perhaps more importantly, where that interaction is not as efficient. In our own program at Washington University, working with colleagues at Ohio State University, as well as internationally, we've in fact built a tool called TimeCat, which is a scalable time motion study tool. And this allows multiple observers to go into an environment using a tablet-based interface and conduct time and motion studies across multiple sites and environments. And to measure that real world workflow and understand how uh, activities such as multitasking may impact the usability of electronic health records or other clinical information systems. These tools also allow us to look at things like inter-observer reliability to ensure that the data we get from multiple observers conducting time motion studies is in fact comparable. And it allows us to produce real-time reports that allow us to make data-driven decisions around optimization strategies for the use of clinical information systems, including EHRs. And this tool, since we built it, is in use in a broad variety of settings globally and has produced over 150 different publications. And it's available today as an open source solution. 
Here you see a few screenshots of the data entry screen, as well as visualizations of time motion study results comparing multiple observers watching different aspects of the same time and motion process. And then finally, a variety of reports, as I mentioned earlier, that can be used to understand and interpret all this data and act upon it to improve the usability of information systems, again, such as EHRs. Next, I want to talk about the issue of data privacy, and in particular, how data privacy and confidentiality concerns may be perceived as barriers to accessing and extracting data from the EHR for research and innovation purposes. Again, much as was the case with usability, there are a number of different methods that we can use to access data from the EHR safely and securely in a way that maintains patient privacy and confidentiality, but also makes that data accessible to a broad range of innovators and researchers. This includes rule-based processes that allow for de-identification through scrubbing of identifiable information, the use of data synthesis tools, federated analytics in which queries are run against source data without actually accessing the data directly, as well as the use of differential privacy mechanisms, which are an emerging set of tools that allow us to introduce certain amounts of noise into data to analyze it in a way in which re-identification becomes infeasible, but the statistical principles of that data remain intact. And again, I'm gonna drill down on one of these topics, in this case, data synthesis. So what do I mean by data synthesis? Well, imagine if you would that the data that's contained in the EHR is a set of features that correspond to an individual patient. And over a set of those features, a given patient would represent a vector with a measurement in each feature space, where those measurements satisfy some sort of density function, whereby that measurement co-occurs with the measurements of many other patients in a given cohort. So you could in fact represent each individual medical record as a set of vectors through multi-dimensional space as you see illustrated here in three dimensions. So what if we could select a set of patients that correspond to a common cohort, then select those features in multi-dimensional space, and then through a process of data synthesis, create a new set of vectors where each individual measurement is not statistically different from the original measurements, but does not share mutual information such that re-identification of the patient from whom the original vector was derived is possible. This introduces an opportunity to create synthetic computationally derived data that keeps the covariance and other statistical principles of the source data without sharing mutual information such that this synthetic data can be used to re-identify the patients from whom it has been derived. And importantly, this synthetic data is no longer human subjects data and it is no longer protected health information because it has zero re-identification risk when compared to other methods of de-identifying or managing patient privacy. At Washington University, working with our partners at MD Clone, a startup from Beersheba, Israel, we've actually evaluated a data synthesis tool that uses the exact methods that I just spoke about a moment ago. And I wanna show you these set of results from a recent evaluative study that we conducted using the MD clone data synthesis tools. In this case, we were building a predictive algorithm to help us identify patients at risk of sepsis at at least six hours prior to standard diagnostic criteria. This would in fact allow us to identify those patients in the hospital and dispatch specialized care teams to intervene before they become critically ill and may need transfer to the ICU. And so using a set of state-of-the-art machine learning tools, in this case, a random forest model, we actually trained an algorithm that was highly accurate in predicting those patients who would become septic within that six hour window. But more importantly, in this table, we show what happens when we train that algorithm using real clinical data derived from the EHR and then test it using a second set of real data from the EHR as compared to when we train that algorithm using synthetic data produced using the MD clone platform, which is synthetic computationally derived data, and then test it on that real clinical data. And the takeaway is that there's really no discernible or important difference in performance in terms of accuracy between the machine learning model that is trained on real data versus synthetic data. But the difference is because that synthetic data is not human subjects data, it's not protected health information, it's able to maintain the privacy of the persons from whom it's been derived, we can actually share it more broadly and reconceptualize how we build these types of models. 
No longer is the process of building this type of machine learning model the purview of just scientists within the academic health center or healthcare delivery system, but we could imagine a model in which perhaps we use a Netflix challenge-like approach where we can create an economy of ideas on how to produce better predictive models because we've limited the confidentiality risk to the patients while maximizing the shareability of this data. And this is a set of tools that is available today that allow us to access the data quickly and easily that is contained within EHRs while maintaining patient privacy. So myth number three, working with vendors is too hard. They make it too difficult to build innovative solutions that can close that evidence gap as I talked about before and enable a learning healthcare system where we act upon the insights that we generate from the secure use of patient generated data. I'm going to argue that this is a false premise. So again, there are a variety of ways in which we can interact with vendor EHRs and actually instrument them for innovation purposes. This can include the use of various application programming interfaces, such as FHIR or vendor specific web services, the use of common data models, the use of common data interchange standards, and again, combined approaches that employ dimensions of all of the aforementioned technologies and frameworks. And so I wanna talk more about how we've used those combined approaches to instrument the electronic health record and achieve the vision of the learning health system or learning health record system that I've already alluded to. So here you see an example of a clinical decision support system designed to interoperate with an electronic health record, a tool that we call Sphere. And Sphere allows us to visualize the many different dimensions that make up the American Heart Association simple seven criteria for cardiovascular disease risk. And here, if you drill in, you can actually see what that tool looks like display with an electronic health record in which we see individual measurements for a patient, including their hemoglobin A1C, cholesterol, blood pressure, smoking status, weight, height, and a number of other physiologic or behavioral criteria. And you'll notice for each one of these criteria, a color code is shown to indicate the relative status of the patient as compared to norms or ideal ranges for those measurements, as well as slider bars and buttons that allow you to interact with those numbers. Because you'll see at the top of the decision support alert that there's actually an overall cardiovascular risk score with both a visualization and a numeric score. And importantly, this is not a static decision support mechanism, but rather one in which the physician can interact with the patient at the point of care and show how changes in each one of these measures in real time may adjust up or down the patient's overall cardiovascular disease risk. And in fact, you can even augment this with additional patient reported data captured through mobile devices concerning dietary exercise and other uh, behaviors that may influence or predispose those individuals to cardiovascular disease. Now, importantly, this platform was designed through an iterative user-centered process, engaging clinician subject matter experts and end users, and is tightly coupled with the workflow in a common electronic health record system, such that the alert can be displayed in line with other aspects of the physician's workflow at the point of care. It doesn't require navigating away from the EHR or opening a new web page or using a new tool, but rather during the clinical encounter, the EHR prompts the provider that this decision support tool is available, allows them to open it in real time, visualize those results, and then engage in patient-centered decision-making, as I described earlier, where they can iterate and look at how different changes in the patient's behavior or other clinical criteria could improve or manage their cardiovascular disease risk. And all of this is built with off-the-shelf existing web service standards that are supported by common commercial EHRs. This is something that can be done today at scale in the EHRs that we see in most, if not all, of our major healthcare delivery systems. And then finally, I want to talk about the myth that IT organizations can make it too difficult or create too many roadblocks to innovating around the use of the EHR in this learning healthcare system paradigm. And my argument is that it requires a tight coupling between informaticians and healthcare IT professionals to navigate a virtuous cycle that includes basic and preclinical research, the verification and validation of new evidence and methods produced through that research, and the scaling and delivery of that evidence in a way that it can be used in real world clinical settings, and then optimizing and measuring impact. And achieving this virtuous cycle means that both healthcare IT professionals 
and research informatics professionals need to have a shared vision of building this rapid learning healthcare system in which we draw upon the academic disciplines shown here, such as bioinformatics and clinical research informatics and public health informatics, but also recognize the unique strengths of IT professionals in terms of technology infrastructure and delivery and performance and scalability and security. And at the core of the shared vision, more important than anything else is shared governance and respect for these unique areas and then a constant iterative cycle in which new innovations are handed off from informatics investigators to healthcare IT professionals to implement. And subsequently, the data concerning the use of those interventions is fed back to the informaticians so that they can then optimize and improve those tools in future generations of such digital interventions. And it's this shared vision, shared governance, and mutual respect that allows us to overcome those roadblocks that people commonly perceive as preventing us from using the EHR as a platform for creating a learning healthcare or learning health record system. Now, you may be saying to yourself, Philip, this all sounds fantastic. Why haven't we already done this? And I'm going to argue that part of the problem is that we haven't really conceptualized the type of research and innovation agenda required to create the learning health record system in a way that allows for success. So if nothing else, I'm going to give everyone listening to this talk a bit of homework, which is to read this book, Pasteur's Quadrant by Donald Stokes. And it tells the story of how Louis Pasteur pursued his groundbreaking research that led to really a groundswell in our understanding of modern medicine. But he did so not by focusing on basic science, which is about theories, or applied science as a discrete endeavor to demonstrate those theories, but rather as a combined approach, which is referred to as use-inspired basic research that involves rapid iteration between basic innovation and applied science, not a linear process of translating basic science into practice, but a process in which basic scientists and applied scientists work shoulder to shoulder, constantly iterating. For those of you that work in the software engineering field, you might recognize this as a variant of agile project management or agile software engineering. And what I'm arguing for is the use of the same agile methods in the form of use-inspired basic research to achieve this vision of a learning health record system. And with that, I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this talk. And hopefully, you will walk away with some ideas about how from a technology from an informatics and from a data science spectrum, we can work together to create a learning health record system in which the EHR becomes a living laboratory in which we have the opportunity to learn from every patient encounter and to use that data to improve the care that patient receives, their family receives, and their community receives. And if you'd like to learn more about this work and the efforts underway at Washington University to build a learning health record system spanning not only Washington University, but also our partners at BJC Healthcare. I encourage you to visit our website at informatics.wustl.edu. You're of course welcome to reach out with questions to me at my email address as shown here. And finally, if you'd like to see what I'm reading or thinking about in terms of the current state of the art in innovation, technology, informatics, data science and healthcare, take a look at my Twitter feed at at PRPain5. And again, thank you for your time and attention. And I hope, again, that you will walk away recognizing the opportunities to leverage the electronic health record to build this vision of a learning health record system. OK, it is 2.15, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for tuning in to Prepare AI 2020 and for tuning in to the Learning Health Record System with Dr. Philip Payne. Um, and we do have Philip joining us here for a live Q&A. Thank you for being here. And we have some really great questions in the chat. Um, so I am gonna go through those. But if you're just joining us and haven't had a chance to ask your question in the chat, please do so in Whova. We are pulling from the session Q&A um, off of the Whova app. And um, we definitely will have time for one or two more questions. So if you think of anything, just go ahead and drop it in Whova and we will be sure to get to it. All right, let's go to this first question. Um, and this is from Charles. And his question is, what is your definition of the golden record? 
All right. Well, thanks, Leah. It's a, it's it's a tough and uh, particularly broad question, but I think you know the the key issue is when we think about trying to understand what happens to either an individual patient or a population of individuals that we either want to deliver care to or conduct research or both. Where do we find that gold standard set of data that really describes all the things that have happened to those individuals? Uh, and unfortunately, I would tell you that I, I don't believe we have that golden record right now. We have records that are somewhat segmented um, by provider organization, by you know data that's produced by individuals themselves and uh, you know held elsewhere in the cloud or on their personal devices and a variety of other sources. So I think one of the challenges in front of us is bringing all those pieces together. And I actually think we have a, a couple of other questions in the chat around some of the challenges of doing so. Uh, but my definition of the golden record is actually not a single record. It would be a collection of records that actually have these relationships between them so that we can piece those various uh, data elements together when we're trying to ask or answer important questions. Perfect. Yes, very broad question, but I think, um, I think you nailed it. Um, the next question says, what are your thoughts about how EHRs can enable support for resources to address social determinants of health, such as access to food, medications, transportation, et cetera? Great question. Yeah, it is a great question. Actually, I can see, uh, I think, you know, the, the question is really getting at this fundamental issue, not just of, you know, uh, the data that might be collected when someone is interacting with a provider, um, but really getting at this fundamental issue of all the other wraparound data that helps us sort of determine what's going to happen to individual and, you know, sort of a, a candid statement. Uh, if we were really focused on delivering precision medicine today, uh, rather than worrying about uh, sequencing patients and finding out more about their genomes or, you know, looking at sensing data, we would focus almost exclusively on social determinants uh, related uh, data because we have a lot of evidence around how environment, behavior, social factors, uh, a variety of other uh, determinants in this broad classification impact health and wellness, and many of them are modifiable either through direct or indirect interventions. So at least at Washington University and BJC, we're working really hard both with the vendor community and directly with our patient community to find out how do we stitch those pieces together? How do we bring in social determinants data from a variety of external uh, sources, integrate it with individual patient records, and then make that all visible to our providers at the point of care? And we use that for everything from, you know, how environmental factors may influence uh, likelihood of a particular diagnosis through making sure we can connect patients with the right transportation so they can get to their appointment or to their treatment and lots of stops in between. So it's a really great question because I would argue that those social determinants data are perhaps one of the most important and frankly underserved data types that we have right now uh, when we're thinking about using the healthcare delivery system as a laboratory to innovate. Wow, that's amazing. The level of integration really um, is amazing. Okay, we have another question in the chat. One member may end up in multiple EHRs at each provider as they visit. To get all data integrated and get a full 360 view of member health data is critical. How do we ensure data for multiple EHRs are aggregated given the HIPAA regulations and use of AI and ML data analytics? Yeah, so that's a, that's a big question. So it goes to the, the prior question around sort of the concept of a golden record and, and my argument that it's actually a collection of records. And at the core of that is the ability to uniquely identify someone and use that unique identify uh, identity to then connect their data across those multiple sources. And the practical reality is we don't have great uh, common identifiers today. Uh, there isn't sort of a single unique ID that we can use across all the various places in which your healthcare data resides. Uh, in fact, we often use a lot of, you know, somewhat fuzzy reasoning methods, such as probabilistic identity mapping to link together data from multiple providers, from public resources or patient reported data in order to try to get a comprehensive picture of what's going on with the patient. So from my perspective, I think it's actually one of the biggest gaps in both our technology and regulatory environments around uh, electronic medical or health records, which is the absence of these common identifiers. Um, there's an argument that's been made that we should not have common identifiers because of the privacy and confidentiality risk. 
But I would actually argue that many of the workarounds that are used to link uh, data appropriately for quality, safety, or continuity of care purposes present even greater risks to individuals from a privacy and confidentiality standpoint than having a common identifier. So I think we really have to ask ourselves, you know, are we doing the best uh, that we can for our patients in terms of continuity of safety and care, and also making sure that we're not delivering redundant care and that we're using all that data to get that sort of 360 uh, view of a patient. So I'd love to tell you there's a magic answer to this question. There's really not. I think there's a lot of work underway. There's some really innovative activities in the startup scene and in uh, big technology firms that like to look at differing models. And, and actually, I think one of the most important models that we really need to take more seriously is the idea that the primary steward of much of this data needs to be the patient themselves. Um, you know, what's the one constant in all of these environments? It's the patient. It's not your provider, it's not a hospital, it's not a clinic, it's not a device manufacturer that gave you a wearable. The constant is the human being. And so it does beg the question, whether it's through our mobile devices, through the cloud or other secure mechanisms, should we be really rethinking the way in which all this data is organized so individuals are able to be that nexus to bring that data together and to help arbitrate some of the confusion around identities and things like that. Um, that would be a wholesale uh, sort of shift in the way that we think about medical records, um, but perhaps one that now more than ever is worthwhile. Uh, I actually believe that mobile devices in particular may represent one of the uh, most uh, transformative ways that we think about this since it's a way for your data to truly travel with you and to use that device as a way to harvest data feeds from many different sources. So. Uh, my hope is in the next five to 10 years, we really see a shift in sort of where that data resides, how we identify people and how we stitch all those pieces together. Wow, that's amazing. And I love what you said just about keeping the human being at the center of the conversation always, even in the midst of all of these um, technology advances. We do have one more question in the chat. I uh, wish we would have done this one first, <laughs> but I think it's still a great one to talk through. The question is, can you talk through the basic version of an EMR? Super basic for dummies. <laughs> is it one file type? Are there standard data fields or structures across all software platforms? Yeah, so there's a lot to that question. And uh, while it's presented as a simple question, it's definitely not a simple question. So, you know, in broad strokes, if you think about electronic medical or health records, what they are is a longitudinal record of all of the activities that define an individual's interaction with the healthcare delivery system. Could be visits to their doctor, could be hospitalizations, laboratory values, uh, medications that they've been prescribed, treatments that they've received, not to mention demographics, medical history, social history, and a number of other sort of important contextual information types. And what the electronic health record does is provide us with a ideally single source in which all that data has been organized and then is presented in a way that supports the needs of providers and patients during any one of those encounters. For example, tell me everything that's happened to this patient beforehand uh, when they show up in the clinic or in the hospital, what medications are they on, uh, what might those medications mean in terms of sort of, you know, the safety of additional treatments we'll give them today? Uh, do they have prior imaging studies? You know, what are their most recent lab values? All of these sort of longitudinal views of the patient's medical history that allow us to make better decisions. Now, as I said earlier, the problem, of course, is that we don't have a single medical record. Every provider, every organization has their own medical record. And so one of the questions is, how do we stitch that data together? And we've talked about that before. But to some of the technical issues that were raised in the question, you know, um, there's not a single file. It's actually a very large constellation of uh, tables in a very complex database structure. In fact, most modern uh, vendor-based electronic health records will have thousands and thousands of database tables in order to represent all the different dimensions of this data. And I'd also love to tell you that there's a common data standard for representing all this data, but there's not. There's actually a variety of standards. Sometimes they're used and sometimes they're not. And so one of the big areas of work in sort of the informatics and data science field is really tools allow us to translate from one representation to another. Uh, you know, I think we are seeing some movement towards more standards uh, that will allow us to build plugins or apps uh, that can interact with electronic health records. The most promising standard being a standard known as FHIR, F-H-I-R. And this is sort of an application programming interface that allows individuals to build uh, sort of a small contained module, perhaps a data visualization tool or a decision support tool that can interact with that patient's data in the EHR and produce a result that's visible to the patient and provider at the point of care. And I think there's great hope that 
that sort of plugin architecture will modernize uh, EHRs in the way that sort of the app store has modernized uh, mobile devices today, where you can get an app for whatever, you know, problem you have, you know, ordering dinner, finding out the, you know, weather forecast or purchasing a, a ticket for a flight uh, as if we were flying places today, but hypothetically a ticket for a flight. Um, and we're really looking to move more towards that sort of model for sort of the electronic health record of the future. Um, so, and then the last part of the question is, what does that mean in terms of our ability to, you know, sort of apply various predictive models to this, you know, say machine learning and artificial intelligence and the like? And I think the answer is we have a lot of work to do in that regard. You know, when I have someone come to, you know, my research group and say, I'm really interested in building a predictive model for a particular disease condition using the data in the electronic health record, my cautionary note to them is always, you're going to spend about 80% of your time working on data engineering, finding that data cleaning it up and getting it ready for analysis. You're really only gonna spend about 20% of your time actually building that really interesting predictive model and then figuring out how to deliver the results back to patients and care providers. And that's the reality of all the issues I talked about before, the lack of widespread use of standards, the fragmentation of data and a lot of other dimensions. So that's another area where we have a lot of active research and development. And certainly at, at Washington University and in our Institute for Informatics, we're very focused on building predictive models that can act upon sort of this messy, incomplete real world data that we find in the EHR rather than waiting for a perfect cleaned up data set. And I think we've been making some great strides in some of the more contemporary machine learning methods that are well tuned to those types of uh, tasks. So I'm not sure I hit the mark in terms of giving a super simple version of what an EMR is. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, we have graduate students that spend their entire career trying to learn how to design and optimize EMRs. So it is a very complex uh, sort of technology platform, but hopefully that was a, a little glimpse of, of sort of what makes up a, a EMR or EHR, depending on the, your preferred acronym. I think that was a great overview. <laughs> Thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, that is all the questions that we have in Whova today. And thank you for the fascinating presentation and for joining us for this live Q&A. We really appreciate it. Well, that concludes this session. Um, if you don't mind, we would love for you to click rate session and tell us what you think at the conclusion. And also feel free to visit our exhibitor hall and thanks for being here and we will see you at the next prepare ai 2020 session have a good day everyone